way? What do you do now? How do you stay successful? It's not, it's not this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make you sit through that video. It's basically three and a half minutes of the exact same ad with quiet piano music playing saying we're with you in these difficult times, by the way, come buy a car. Okay. And so when this first happened, a lot of brands were really nervous and so they didn't know what to do. And so they did these very, very, very similar like piano music type, like we're with you ads. But we're seeing the, we're seeing the, the world change and, and thankfully businesses change too. So they're not just saying, hey, we're with you. They're starting to focus on solutions. So as I was putting this together, Jesper and I talked about this um, months ago. And I was like, well, I'll probably do the, you know, I can do the top five rules. And then as I kept working on this presentation, I thought there's, there's one rule, there's one rule. And the one rule is businesses need to create solutions that match customers' needs. If you had me, uh, if you had me at AVT uh, for my class, this is what I talk about in marketing. It's all about um, finding solutions for our customers' needs. And that's, that's always true. That's always true. It was true before, it's true now, and it's gonna be true afterwards. All right, and if we can keep our focus on that and use that to guide us, I think we can find success. And so let me, let me tell you what I mean. We're gonna start through the, the consumer's lens or our customer's lens, like we always do, right? And if we think about it, our customers are going through a changing situation, whether it's a B2B customer, whether it's a, a B2C customer. Because of this changing situation, their day-to-day -day needs are different than they were in January, right? And their behaviors are different than they were in January, okay? And so that means we have to adapt. Now, if you, if you look at this, it's hard to paint like one brush and say everybody's changing the exact same way because it's not, it's, it's different. It's different by, and I'll have a copy of these if you want these, these charts. But basically, I just wanted to give you just uh, a sense for this of the, this is a chart that shows the, the level of planned spending and optimism by country. And some of them are very optimistic. Some of them are less optimistic. You know what I mean? It's, it's not like the same situation in every place. And that's true even within countries. Within countries, there are different areas that are, that are completely kind of unaffected by this almost right? Especially in the States, we've got so many different regions. Some regions have never even had a COVID incidence, whereas we've got New York that's been locked down for, you know, since the middle of March. If you, you can look at the same thing where the anticipated spending by category is also changing. I've got friends in the food business that cannot keep up with demand. This is their best sales year they've ever had because they're doing so well. Uh, my, old, my old companies that, that sold, you know, basically consumer packaged goods, for home. But the important thing for all of us to realize is that we have to kind of take a new look at, at our customers and see because of this changing situation, how have their needs evolved and changed? What are the new needs that they're looking to solve, right? This is just a laundry list to kind of just get your juices flowing about like, what else can we think about? What are there other new needs that they have to solve? I mean, there's simple things like the fact that I bought, I probably spent $1,500 on electronics to outfit my office here to teach this spring. There's all of the activities we bought for the family because we had to stay home and do things here, right? There's the fact that we're probably doing more car travel instead of plane travel this summer. Our needs have changed, okay? And when needs change, that opens up new opportunities for business. And so what we have to do from a business lens then 
is go back and look at our assets, our assets of our, of our company. I'll talk more about that. Think about how we might adapt our solutions and then think about how we might adapt our tactics to the changing behavior of these consumers. So let me talk about assets. I'll have some examples here in a second, but I want you to think about all of the things that your company does, not what they make, but what, what you have, what you're able to do, right? Think of the ingredients that you use today to make your offerings. It could be know-how and expertise. It might be your people, your technical capabilities, your locations. There's all sorts of things that you have. Think about this like ingredients that you would use to bake a cake, right? For years, you've used these ingredients to bake this cake and you've sold this cake. Now, in some industries, we're finding that people don't want that cake anymore. They want a different cake. They have a new need. You can use your ingredients to make a new cake, to make a pie, whatever. So it's, this, it's this, your, your same ingredients, but how can you use those ingredients to make something new that solves a new need? And so we layer these things on each other and we think about consumers have a changing environment that leads to changing needs and changing behaviors. We have a collection of assets as a firm. And so we have to take those assets and change them into solutions that match these new needs. Let me give you some examples. I thought this was interesting. This is from a, um, a large, it's an Indiana University. It's a real big university in the Midwest here in the States. There's a hotel there, right? Big hotel on campus. And no one's gonna go to that hotel. There's no parents weekends. There are no visits. There's no football games that we know about. No one is going to go to this hotel. Hotels are down. So what they did last week, they sent out an email to the parents of the students. And one of the parents lives in my neighborhood. I heard this, uh, I was talking to him. And what he said was the hotel is now offering student housing. The hotel knows they're not gonna fill the hotel with, with, with guests. So that what they're doing is they're saying, do you have a student going to Indiana University? They can stay in our hotel on a month by month contract. The rates are relatively low. The hotel has a restaurant. They'll feed the student three meals a day. Same ingredients. We have rooms and food. We do not have our old need. Our old need was people traveling for business or to visit the school. That's not here, but we do have students. And the student's need is they don't want to be in the same room as another student, right? So I can give students a private room and they can fill their hotel. Another example I saw, this is a local restaurant train called Panera. And they make sandwiches and soups and things like that. What they figured out was that their supply chain delivers things like milk, egg, butter, all of these things to their stores to make their products. Well, consumers right now, I mean, grocery stores here are like maybe the worst, right? Grocery stores are like packed and they're, you know, it's not, it's not the place you want to be. What Panera figured out was the ingredient, they've got all these ingredients that people need, these groceries, they have a drive through window and they're really good at it. So what they started doing is just basically selling groceries through the drive through There's no grocery chain that can do that. So they've used their unique assets to meet this new need. And now they're selling groceries. Another example I just saw, and I liked, I liked the quote from this one. This is a restaurant in town. It's, a, it's a kind of a famous restaurant called Fat Rice. And they've reopened as a market. Okay. And the quote is, I love this. It wasn't what can restaurants do now? It was what is a restaurant? What are its capabilities? How can we continue to feed people great food and take care of them? And so it's, it's kind of saying like, I know what our old solution was, but what are our capabilities and how can we use those capabilities to solve a new need? And then my last one had to give a shout out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> theme parks down, education space need up. So the, uh, the, the gardens are, are turned into, uh, looks like they've been turned into a kindergarten. So same, same basic principle, right? How can you repurpose your assets to solve new needs? Now, the last part of this, the last part of this was they've got changing needs. They also have changing behaviors. And so one of the first things that I told some of the folks that I work with, some of my clients I work with was, Whatever 
marketing tactics you were doing in February might not be the same ones we use now. If you look at some of the behavior changes in terms of advertising, like the ones at the bottom, like no one's going to the movie theaters, right? There's not a lot of people on public transit, but we are seeing a massive increase in like video on demand, social media, things like that. And, <coughs> and so a lot of firms, <coughs> some firms are, are pulling down media spend right now, they're pausing it. But a lot of firms like P&G are actually maintaining or increasing spend because they're getting a good deal on a lot of these assets right now. And they're just shifting the mix. They're shifting the mix to where people are, which makes sense. In fact, I heard yesterday that Facebook's uh, rates, their ad rates had gone down for the last several months as advertisers pulled back. But as of yesterday, they were right back up to where they were pre COVID. So the advertisers are jumping back in, uh, at least on Facebook, pretty hard right now. The other big change we're seeing is the acceleration of online shopping. Europe's always been ahead of the US in online shopping, particularly in online grocery. But we're seeing, um, you know, it's, it's, it's end up being like your parents that have, that have never done it before. And now they're starting to do it. There's a lot of behavior shifts to online that people had in the works, but they aren't, they, they just had it, uh, they were kind of slowly moving towards it. And now it's going full speed. There's a restaurant chain called BW3s. It makes these chicken wings. And I was talking, I had a guest speaker the other day from a large media agency. And the, their client is BW3s. BW3s is a, is a restaurant bar you would go to to watch sports. Okay? It's big for sports. When they canceled sports in the U.S., terrible for their business. Because it's a place you go watch sports with your friends. What they found is they had this online commerce piece ready to go, but they were being slow. They completely accelerated it. They changed their marketing tactics to be focused on performance marketing, basically like getting people to buy directly. And what I heard, what he told me was that the business that they did in the last week online was equal to the business they did in their restaurants on Super Bowl Sunday. And I, I mean, Super Bowl Sunday, that is like the day everyone eats wings in the States, right? It was incredible. And so this, this, these companies that have been embracing the shift, the shift in needs and the shift in behaviors are finding tremendous success. Yeah, this last one I saw, PepsiCo, right? So huge food company, PepsiCo, has been hesitant to do a direct-to-consumer uh, business, right? because you don't want to offend Walmart and everybody else. But PepsiCo has launched, I think, two new direct to consumer channels where you can buy potato chips and things like that directly from PepsiCo now. This is not something that would have happened without COVID, right? But they're accelerating this. The last one I saw was my, it's not online, but I thought it was really interesting just as a way to take advantage of new needs and new behaviors. This is in Poland. And this enterprising company has come out with these vending machines and the vending machines sell things like gloves, masks, hand sanitizer, all the things that you'd want. And maybe you don't want to go into the local uh, pharmacy to buy these. And so you can buy them right on the street. And so they put these things up, sell them like crazy. They have the capabilities, they see the changing behaviors, they meet the changing behaviors and changing needs to create solutions. Right. And so if you think about it, you've got these consumers in the changing situation that leads to new needs. You have a company that has assets and capabilities. You create new solutions to meet those needs. And then in the middle, we have to figure out where is this? Where do we meet them best? Where do we meet them best to solve their needs now because their behaviors are changing? And where do we meet them best? That could be different places we advertise. That could be different places we sell. But the important thing is it's all through the consumer lens. We start with the consumer lens. What do they need? What are their behaviors? And then we marshal our assets and capabilities to meet those needs. So it's not five, it's one. <laughs> but 
that's that's what I, that's that's how I think that I'm seeing the businesses best solve it in today's environment. I see a question from Hey Maddie, uh, you have an example from a service or B two B company. Oh, that's that's a good question. I'm trying to think of a good service example. And uh, while you do that, uh, Kevin, uh, just to remind people that you can actually ask uh, Kevin questions through the chat function if you just click on. Uh, that's and then uh, you can write there. Um, so, that's a good question. So from a service industry standpoint, most of what I've seen is I've seen a couple different things. Um, most of it is, is a slight adaptation based on people's need to for people's not wanting to have interaction. So I've seen little things like dry cleaners that will, you know, before they may have done pickup. Now they're doing like touchless pickup, right, where you can they'll come get it take it away, bring it back. I've seen a million of these commercials where they talk about how they are going to be um, coming to your house, but they're going to be wearing masks and they've got all these cleanliness. And a lot of these with these service companies where they've got to be in some kind of contact, the emphasis is on reducing your level of anxiety about having strangers near you. Right. So it's all about how it's all about reinforcing that, like, no, they're going to be safe. They're going to take care of all this from a B2B standpoint, just from talking to some friends in the industry. The biggest change I've seen is honestly the is honestly this, this virtual shift. Most of my friends are not going back into the office until at the at earliest fall. OK. And what I've found is that for a lot of these firms, so I've got some firms that are hurting and some firms are doing well. One of my friends said he's never been able to get talent like this. So he's hiring like crazy. And he's like, we also, even when we go back to the office, we're so used to this virtual that I'm not afraid to hire people that aren't in Chicago. And so I'm getting great talent. I'm getting great talent that's not in Chicago. And I think we found that we can work pretty easily like this. And so I think what we're going to see is a shift to even more remote working than we were doing before um, because people are just getting used to it, right? It's not perfect, but people are getting used to it. And so I think we're going to see a big shift there. And Kevin, how is, how, because of course the world's biggest economy, um, we, we all kind of dependent on the U.S. How, how, what was the feel for, of you either B2B or B2C in terms of the spending. Uh, of course, with the high unemployment, uh, the world is kind of scared that, you know, the, um, the economic uh, situation will, will be pretty terrible. So yeah. What was your feeling in terms of um, spending? What's interesting is I feel like our unemployment numbers are inflated because I've so I have some friends that own manufacturing businesses and they've temporarily laid people off because the government benefits will pay those people better during a layoff than they will if they were to stay with the company. Right. And so a lot of people are just doing a temporary furlough. And so I think these jobs, even though the numbers look bad, I don't think they're that bad. I think a lot of it is that the government is subsidizing heavily right now. And so a lot of my friends are just like, listen, I'll lay these people off. And if, if they made under US $50,000, then they're making more money than they would have had I kept them in my employ. And right. so I think that's driving a lot of it. I mean, what's surprising to me a little bit is our stock market is like doing fine. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the general consensus is that as long as we can get something some kind of treatment or some kind of vaccine by uh, early January, people generally here feel pretty confident this isn't going to be, this isn't going to be terrible. That's, you know, if you're talking to a marketing guy though, not an economist. Sure. <laughs> um, question that's coming in. How do you best go about identifying, observing new customer needs in this environment? Yeah, that's so interesting. That's great. Um, so a couple of different things. Um, one, I'm looking at like secondary research. There's a lot of the firms like McKinsey and some of the other big ones that are continuing to do big studies that are really helpful. Um, one of my friends uh, works at an advertising agency 
and they're trying to adapt quickly to this. And what they're doing is most of their research now is online. I think my wife got uh, suckered into doing uh, uh, an online research call like today or tomorrow um, about home fitness. And so we're, we're, still, we're still going out and talking to consumers. We're just not going out and talking to them live, right? So it's, it's kind of the traditional tools we've been using. We're using secondary research because a lot of firms are still asking. And then we're still doing primary research by going out and, and fielding studies. It's a little tricky to do this primary research because people's minds are so, especially like right now in the U.S., there's so much going on that it's kind of hard to get them to step back and say, yes, but like, <laughs> what do you really feel about chocolate, right? So it's a little hard to get some of those answers because there's so much else going on, but we can still, we can still talk to consumers and, and still uh, do some of the research tools we were doing before. Um, I see another question. Are consumers willing to pay more related to convenient shopping before versus after? Um, I think yes. Right. And so it's not just the convenience. Think of like there's convenience in having your groceries delivered and that's convenience. But if you add in the other benefits of like, I don't want to be exposed to that environment. Um, that was a barrier before. I don't, I'm, I don't trust that they're going to pick the right produce for me or something like that. I think that was a barrier before. And I think what we're seeing is there was a group of people that were very happy with some of these like more convenient options. And there's people that were holdouts and the holdouts that just had some barrier to doing these things are now coming in. And I think I'm hesitant to say that like life's going to be totally different after this is over. Generally speaking, people go back to their behaviors after crises is what we've seen over and over again. But I think I'd be, I'd have a hard time believing that once you experience some of these more convenient options, even if it's a premium, you'll go back quickly to the less convenient option. I think that that's where we're going to, I think we're going to, I think the online commerce shift that we're seeing in some categories that wasn't as high before, that's going to remain pretty high. Great. In, in terms of communication, um, let's say we've, we've a small and medium sized company and we've actually got some assets to, uh, and we've, found a new segment in our market, but it's not our existing customers, but we see that we can actually service some other, uh, another segment. So, but, but if we are, you know, a small company, not having the resources to big advertising, how do, how do, how do, do organizations like that approach uh, targeting that new segment? Yeah. So this is, this is the hard part because no one's got unlimited resources besides, you know, Amazon. And so generally speaking, um, what I'm seeing is like little tests into these markets, right? You don't have the people or money, right? To go, you know, like, let's go after this and we'll just chase it down with everybody. And so I'm seeing like, let's test this out. Let's try this out with a couple of new clients in this area. We'll see how it goes. And then if it doesn't work great, then we pull back and we try something new. But it's, it's a lot of very like, limited like trials into these new markets and it's um, starting small honestly starting small and then letting the results either prove out prove out to senior management that, like yes it's worth it for us to go further into this market oh brilliant um and um if if you are uh, interested um kevin is actually a co-author of the kellogg on branding um, in a hyper-connected world. So, and he, he's, um, he's got a really interesting uh, uh, chapter where he talks about uh, consumer journey and how do you map, you know, potential customer needs um, uh, to fit your organization's assets, of course, uh, in the end. Um, you know, so I was gonna say, yes, but yeah, it's funny, like doing the simple journey mapping right now is, is probably a great idea because the journey map you had last year is probably different than it is today. And so, you know, if you've had me for class, one of the things that I love talking about is doing really simple journey maps just to paint a clearer picture of, of where your customer is and where you can best need, meet them to solve their needs. So, hey, thanks for the shout out. <laughs> <laughs> and of course you can buy the book uh, in any bookstore, I'm sure. Right. <laughs> 
No, but uh, time is running, um, so it's already half an hour. Uh, but thank you very much for, for joining us, uh, Kevin. And, um, Absolutely. And, and we'll send out the, uh, the slides uh, to you, and you can watch the full video, perhaps, uh, once you get that. So Great. hopefully the participants also have got uh, some good takeaways, and uh, we look forward to see you another time. And hopefully you have, will have great success uh, in the rest of 2020. Uh, Thank you, Jasper. You. Okay. And talk to you soon, Kevin. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. See you in Copenhagen.